Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I'd like to take a minute to welcome everybody to the San Marcos Adventist Church. Um, and I would like to start with a word of prayer. Um, I'm going to pray for everybody's allergies because I know those are <laughs> attacking all of us right now. Um, Pastor Josh and Danya send their greetings. They're going to be back in town relatively soon, but they'll be back uh, next Sabbath for church. So if you guys would all bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning, for waking each of us up and bringing us to church this morning. Uh, whether we are here in person or online, able to worship in our own homes. Um, please bless everyone and their families. Help those who are suffering uh, with illnesses or injuries or even just allergies. Help everyone to recover and to feel better as quick as possible. Uh, be with our speaker today. Um, help his words to be your words. Uh, help us to listen and hear them, um, knowing that um, we are here to worship you. Thank you so much for our loving church family. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. for the children's story. So if the children want to come up. All right, any other kids? Okay. All right, so I wanna tell you a story of what happened to us a couple years ago. Have you ever had a garden? Have you ever had a garden that you grew flowers in or you grew vegetables or fruits in? Mm -hmm. right there. Anyone had a garden? What did you grow in it? Tomatoes and potatoes and herbs is amazing. What did you grow in yours? fruits and flowers. Awesome. Well, we grew a big, big vegetable garden a couple years ago. And the plants, they were growing and growing. And then all of a sudden, they had all these flowers on them. And if you didn't know, the flowers is what actually grows into the vegetable or the fruit. And we had all these beautiful flowers, and then nothing grew. So, the way that God made everything, the way that God made the garden and the birds and the bees, the bees is what helps pollinate the garden. And when the bees come and they get the nectar out of the flower, they go to the next flower and to the next flower, and then they take the pollen from one to another. And that's what pollinates, and that's what grows the vegetables, okay? So we decided to get bees to help pollinate our garden. And these little bees, come on over. This is what we wear to go inside of our beehive. Doesn't it look funny? Looks kind of like an astronaut or something, doesn't it? Yep. And then we, whenever we want to check on the bees to see if they have baby bees to have more things to pollinate, or if we want to see what else do, what else do bees make? Honey. honey. Bees make honey. We also check for honey inside of the honeycomb. 
So this is what we wear. And we open up the beehive. And we take out and look for the honey. honey. <laughs> this is not what honey looks like when it comes out of a, the a hive, but these little straws are filled with honey. Okay? These are actually for y'all. I'll take that. Do you want to read the Bible verse? Sure. You got one. You got one. You got one. You got one. So the Bible verse today is Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and faithfulness. Okay. That is the end of story. Hurry back to your seats. Uh, we are finishing up our adventure year. It's been kind of a low-key year with COVID. If you don't know, we have an adventure club for ages uh, four through nine. And these are two of our oldest boys. This is actually their last year in adventures. And this year, their final project was to uh, make a replica of the tabernacle. And they are, this is our helping hands class, minus three or four who were out of town this week. Uh, and uh, so this is Asa and Joshua, and they're both nine, and they're in our Helping Hands group this year. So I'm just going to ask them a few questions about their project. Um, and if you kids, um, uh, we'll, we'll bring it, they'll bring it down where you guys can see it in a minute. Uh, did, first of all, did you guys enjoy making your, uh, your tabernacle replica? Um, what did you? What did you enjoy doing with this project, Asa? My favorite part was um, probably the playing with the clay and molding everything. Joshua, what did you enjoy? Building the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. Uh, so, Joshua, you mentioned the Ark of the Covenant. That was one of the main things that he worked on. Is there anything else that you, uh, that you built? The, the table with the bread on it. And also, what, were, what, was, what did you work on on this project? Well, I made the altar sacrifice, and I also made the two angels to cover the cherubim, the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. What do we have on top of our tabernacle here, boys? It's uh, goat skin and beaver skin. Goat skin and beaver skin. Can we pull it back so we can see the inside? When it's all done, we'll lower it so you kids can look at it, too. Um, so on the inside, we have all of the different pieces of furniture. Um, why did God ask them to build a tabernacle? Do you boys remember? So they could, he would he'd be with them? So that he could be with them? And what, how, what was the sign that he was with them? What was over the tabernacle during the day and night? The cloud and the pillar of fire. Um, and so what would happen every day in the tabernacle? Asa, you, you were talking quite a bit about that last night. What would happen during the day in the tabernacle? What did the, what, what did the priests do? They would sacrifice an animal. What did this animal repre re represent, Joshua? Is Jesus dying on the cross? Uh, Joshua, can you tell me, there seems to be some water in a bowl, in a, in a, and a, uh, a bowl in the outer courtyard. What was the purpose of the water? 
They washed their feet and hands before they went in the holy place. And Asa, you did a lot of work on the uh, on the uh, the temple. You built it and you erected it and you helped to hang the curtains. What was some of the other furniture inside of the tabernacle? Well, there was the uh, the um, t- the altar of incense and the lampstand. Uh, Joshua, can you tell me what you put inside the Ark of the Covenant? Can you take it out and take off the lid so that we can see what's inside of it? You can go down there and uh, Asa actually Asa actually made the cherubims on top of the Ark with the angel with the wings touching, and Joshua helped to put to build the Ark. Can you take it down there and show them what's inside? What's inside the Ark, Joshua? The Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant and the Moses' staff oh, and, no, no, and, and manna. And the manna. Okay. Um, I, I know I learned something new. I had always assumed from the pictures and everything that the Ten Commandments were on two white pieces of stone. But what were the Ten Commandments actually on? Lapis lie. Lapis lie. And what color is that? Blue. Blue. So the Ten Commandments were actually written on blue stone, which I found very interesting as we were working on this project. Miss Anita is actually the one that taught this class, and we're missing Kennedy uh, Zauber. She did a lot of the work on this as well. She worked. Uh, she helped to build uh, and glue the outer courtyard together. Uh, I know you guys talked with Miss Anita about how the earthly tabernacle is just a replica, a copy. Where is the where is the 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 real tabernacle right now? In heaven. And who's inside of it right now, Asa? And what's he doing? God. Is Jesus in the is Jesus in the tabernacle right now? Yes. And what's he doing? He is cleansing it. He's cleansing it so that we can be ready to go to heaven with him, right? Did either of you boys have anything else you wanted to add about your project? No. I don't think so. Okay. So they worked really hard on this and we're very proud of them and this is our last uh, we had our last meeting, and they, along with Kennedy, worked really hard, and they spent quite a bit of time and trying to make it accurate. Emily, off. Shh. Okay, so if you want to see it, we'll have it on the, on the table out in the foyer, and you can come take a look at it after church. Uh, in the meantime, uh, most of the kids can go back to their seat, but our adventurers have a special song for you. actually missing I think three or four families so what you see here are, are my kid are the the Heath children and the Diakaris kids but we're missing usually we have a uh, Behar bottle we have the Zauber girls and uh, Tinley is missing today so hopefully we can make up for our volume that we are missing today so
I have a quick announcement. We have had a kind of a wild week. Pastor had a call from a woman in San Antonio who is a pastor there, and she has been meeting with the young people who are in detention from coming across the border, and they were asking for Bibles. And so we went ahead and ordered 500 Bibles <laughs> for the kids down there. They're Spanish Bibles, and they are going to be distributing them this next weekend, and we have enough of them. We'd like to share some with you with the work that needs to be done, if you are interested. Afterwards, they need to have the Bible inscribed with the words on it, saying it's a gift from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and that they're loved by God and will be prayed for. So if you're interested in that mission, uh, see me after church, and we'll make sure you get connected with some Bibles. All right? Thank you, and sorry to interrupt. We're anxious to hear part two of Ralph's message. Happy Sabbath. You're all going, oh, he brought more books. <clears throat> and notes. like to set the tone for the message today by reading from Patriarchs and Prophets. It's a chapter entitled Idolatry at Sinai, page 323. We all know the story. Moses has spent time up on Mount Sinai with the Lord, receiving the Ten Commandments. All the while, the people down at the base of the mountain in the camp are, I'm told, like, people can't hear me. Is this working? Is this better? Okay. Let me start over. I'm going to start by reading from Patriarchs and Prophets, a chapter on idolatry at Sinai. Page 323, Moses has spent time in the mountain with God, receiving the Ten Commandments. All the while, the people at the base in the camp have been worshiping a golden calf. Moses comes down and discovers this. We all know the story. And he lights into everybody including his brother Aaron. Note the people's response. When Moses, on returning to the camp, confronted the rebels, his severe rebukes and the indignation he displayed in breaking the sacred tables of the law were contrasted by the people with his brother's pleasant speech and dignified demeanor. And their sympathies were with Aaron. To justify himself, Aaron endeavored to make the people responsible for his weakness in yielding to their demand. But notwithstanding this, they were filled with admiration of his gentleness and patience. But God seeth not as man sees. Aaron 
Aaron's yielding spirit and his desire to please had blinded his eyes to the enormity of the crime he was sanctioning. His course in giving his influence to sin in Israel cost the life of thousands. In what contrast was this with the course of Moses, who, while faithfully executing God's judgments, showed that the welfare of Israel was dearer to him than prosperity or honor or life? When I first read this passage many years ago, one line has haunted me for years. But God seeth not as man sees. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for this Sabbath, for the holiness that you've blessed it with, for sharing this blessing with us. We love you, Father. You've drawn us here. We ask, Lord, that you receive our time and attention as worship, that it be made worthy in the power and blood of Jesus, who stands for us before you. I ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, for myself, for everyone here and those watching now and later. Your words are the words of life. Please help us. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is part two of getting to the real real. We've established that at my age I can still get away with saying that. So I'm saying it. There is a subtitle. The subtitle is, Yes, I'm Talking to You. Sorry, not sorry. And by you, that's inclusive. Me too. Last week we spoke about the need for the mind of Christ to develop it, to exercise it, to grow in it. The scripture says that we have the mind of Christ. It is not something to attain or to obtain or plead. It's given to us. But it is for us to develop in cooperation with God's spirit. And we talked about that last time. We also spoke about how the battle is for the mind, that our minds are broken. Our minds are incapable of truly appreciating the truth of God's word not just conceptually, but practically in our lives. We need a new mind, hence the mind of Christ. Satan, however, battles to confuse and deceive and to cloud, to blind the minds of every single one of us. And so God has given us his spirit to guide us into all truth, so that we might pierce through the confusion and the blindness that Satan would instill upon all of us, so that he's not able to take us away captive at his will. Just because we have the mind of Christ, however, does not mean Satan says, oop, I lost that one. I'll just move on. That's not the case at all. He continues to pursue those who have gotten away, those who have left his kingdom of darkness to enter into the kingdom of God's light. He continues to pursue. He is a merciless and pitiless predator, and he does not give up. And he knows the odds, all things being considered, are in his favor. Because whereas he does not give up, he knows all too well that we do. It's a gamble he's willing to take.
And so he continues to pursue those who have received the good news of Jesus Christ, who have received the mind of Christ. And he wields one weapon. One. It is extremely effective. It comes in many guises, persecution, peer pressure, rewards, honor, pleasure, entertainment, you name it. All of these are guises that disguise one tool that the devil has. One. And we're going to be talking about that today. Because it is the threat that we face as we do, seek to develop and grow into the mind of Christ. Turn with me now. A good place to start is in Revelation. And start at the end. Revelation chapter 12. We know it well. Let's look at verses 7 through 9. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. War in heaven. We're told that this war is as real as any war that you could ever imagine here on earth. It was real. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Did you catch it? His instrument, his weapon, his tool, his ploy, his strategy is right there in verse 10. I'm sorry, in verse 9. Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. That is Satan's ploy. Deception. Deceit. Lies. It's how he got a third of the angels to side with him. He lied. He lied. I look back in my own experience and my struggles, the depression I felt, the frustration that was mine constantly when I realized that I couldn't love Jesus because I wasn't obeying God's law the way I wanted to or the way I believed I needed to. Therefore, I couldn't love Jesus because he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so I had it twisted. I don't love Jesus. I blew it. I don't love Jesus. I couldn't sing the songs with a clear conscience. Oh, how I love Jesus. My Jesus, I love thee. How I, lo I couldn't sing those because I knew that I was not keeping God's commandments the way I felt that I ought to. And Jesus said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. It wasn't until many years that I realized that God pierced through the darkness in my mind and showed me that I misread. It was a promise. He literally, he, the Lord, literally said, if you love me, my commandments you will keep. Loving him is the cause of obedience, not the other way around. And the first thing that came to me after, oh, thank God, was almost physically looking at the devil and saying, you lied to me. Big surprise. He's lied to each and every one of you about something. Probably a lot of things. But that's his tool, and he's done it from the beginning. War in heaven, he will continue to do it. In Revelation 20, it says that as soon as the millennium is over, what does he do? He goes out to deceive the nations. That's his tool. That's his weapon. That's his modus operandi, the way he does things. That's what he does. He did it in Eden. Look in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2.
1 Timothy chapter 2, let's look at verse 14. It's a simple statement. Paul says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. There was deception in the Garden of Eden. This is what Satan used. He deceived Eve. That's how he did it. So what did he do? It's really simple when you look at it. Let's go there. We started at the end, now let's go to the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. Let's really pay attention to what happened. We're just going to look at what Satan said. We know the story. Satan through the serpent in the garden speaking to Eve. Genesis chapter 3, let's look at verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Let's look at verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Going on, he says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What did he do? We know it was deception. Paul has said so. But what did he do? What was the deception? Twofold. Satan's ploy of deception is to distort what God has said, has God said? That little uptick in the tone, the intonation. Has God said? Question. Uncertainty. You will not die. He distorts. And then disregard. Disregard. Here's the truth. Here's what I know what God said, but. God knows. Satan was claiming to know what God really meant. Never mind what he said. Here's what he really meant. Here's the secret meaning. Here's God's intent. Don't worry about the words. Forget what he said. So he starts out, did he say? And then he says, and actually it doesn't matter if he did. Here's what he really meant. So go ahead and do it. There are whole movements in the world today that will tell you that Satan, or Lucifer, is the hero in the Genesis story because he was helping Adam and Eve achieve their true potential. There are people who teach that today. Deception questioning, distorting God's word, and then disregarding God's word. This is what he does in many ways, in many forms, but when you look at it, when you look at it, each and every example of deception, there they are. Distortion and disregard. Distortion and disregard. It isn't just at the end, and it isn't just at the beginning that he deceives. He's doing it now. We are not immune. We are not immune. Let's go back to 1 Timothy. Only now we're going to look at chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, let's look at verses 1 and 2. First Timothy 4, 1 and 2. As a side note, can I, can I express a little frustration? I get we're in a digital age. The buzzword now is digital transformation. 
press here, click here, automate that. There is a problem, and it's cool, it's fun, right? But there's a problem. We are not digital. We are analog, and the older we are, the more analog we are. <laughs> People, communication, language, thought is not digital. It's analog. Why am I come talking about that? Bring your Bibles. <laughs> Bring them. There's actually research that shows that you engage with the word when you have a Bible and not a screen. I'm not knocking screens. I've got them. I've got some great stuff on my Bible apps. The EGW2 app, God send. But I got something in my hand, a Bible. I find now that we don't give each other time to look things up in church so we can see for ourselves. The scripture says that the noble example of a believer were those who looked to see if what was being said was true. But you can't do that if you don't have time. So if I'm not giving you time to look up a scripture, I don't care if you're tapping or flipping a page, please say something. I want you to see it for yourself. All right, 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now the Spirit, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. In other words, he says very plainly, there's no chance of misunderstanding, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In the last days, doctrines of devils will be taught in the church and believed by people in the church. Their consciences have been seared. What does that mean? They have no ability to sense right or wrong or whether the doctrine that they are receiving and teaching is false. They are incapable of detecting it. Incapable. We are not immune. Not only are we not immune, we welcome it. Look at what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're looking at verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4. But I fear, lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds, so your what? Minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, for if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. It is possible to believe in another Jesus that is not Jesus. It is possible to believe in another gospel that is not the gospel. And it is possible to receive another spirit that is not the spirit of God. Deception. But look at what he said. You might well bear with him. Today, the King James Version doesn't really pack a punch, but it really does. What he's saying is, you guys are going to be so nice about it. You're going to welcome it. 
you're going to put up with it. And not just put up with it, you're going to put up with it with beaming smiles. You're going to be beautiful about it. Another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, and you're going to put up with it. That is Satan's objective. To corrupt the mind away from the simplicity that is in Christ. So, why talk about something so heavy? Some would even say depressing. <laughs> why? I could think of lighter things to talk about. I could think of funner things to talk about. There are things that I would rather talk about. But I'm finding as I look at the scripture that I'm not alone. Look in the book of Jude. It's only one chapter. In the book of Jude, let's look at verse 3 and then verse 4. Jude, verses 3 and 4. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, catch that, Jude said, when I sat down to write this letter, I was going to talk to you about Jesus. I was going to talk to you about our salvation. Great stuff, good news. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. He says, I was going to talk to you about Jesus and our salvation in him, but instead I find I need to talk to you and warn you and encourage you to stand up for what's true. Why? For there are certain men crept in unawares. They've snuck in. You didn't detect them. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness. That means grace being an excuse a pass to do things however we want, including the most degenerate activity. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Catch that. The ultimate goal of deception is to disconnect us from the Lordship of Jesus to foster rebellion, to ensnare us in sin and destroy us. It's dangerous. False doctrine is dangerous. Deception is dangerous because if left unchecked, souls are lost. And so Jude, he says, I wanted to talk to you about salvation. But I realized there's a danger, and I need to talk to you about standing up for the truth. We're not immune. There is danger. There's danger here in this church. There's danger in our homes. There's danger in our denomination. I'm convinced more than ever we're in the last days. More than ever. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about some examples of deception. It is not my intent to attack anyone. It's not my intent to expound on every point. It is my intent to draw attention to certain ideas that have been in the church, points of deception, where it goes. Some of you will think that you know where I'm going with some of this. I will tell you now, you are not. You are not correct. But, I did warn you not to come. Let's look at the first example. Turn in 1 Corinthians chapter 1.
1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 23 and 24. 1 Corinthians 1, 23, 24. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. It's one of my favorite texts. Jesus is the power and wisdom of God. How can that be a problem? Well, it isn't. But it has been distorted when you look at another text. And it is used often by a growing number of people within the Adventist church. So let's look at it. Look at Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. Let's start at verse 22. The Lord, oh, I should point out, chapter 8 is speaking of wisdom. You see that in verse 1. So speaking of wisdom, this is wisdom actually speaking in chapter 8 of Proverbs. Wisdom is speaking. And wisdom says... The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, was I brought forth. Okay. There is a growing number of people that connect this passage with what we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where it says that Christ is the wisdom of God, and say, there, wisdom was brought forth. It had a beginning. That wisdom is Jesus. He had a beginning. Now, there are a lot of things I could say about that, but let me ask you, was there ever a time God was was without power? Was there? Was there ever a beginning to God's power? No. Well, then what about wisdom? Was there ever a time when God was without wisdom? As long as there was a God, there was wisdom. He possesses it. To say that because Jesus is wisdom and it says that he was brought forth, therefore Jesus had a beginning, is nonsense. The Father was never without wisdom. He was never without his Son. The Son has no beginning. None. The scripture says that he is as if he were one who grew up with the father. As long as there was a father, there was a son. Now there's a lot more to be said. I don't have time. But that's that's the sum of it. What's interesting, though, is Deception, distortion, eventually leads to disregard of God's will. I once was flipping through YouTube, and a video popped up, and it it said, um, couple thrown out of Adventist church. You know, okay, what's that about? And it says, you know, this couple, I mean, it's headlines and all this, you know. It says, couple thrown out of the Advent. I mean, there's somber music. 
You just want to, something horrible has happened to them. There's been an injustice. This couple has been thrown out of this Adventist church. And I think, why? Why? Was it because they were telling the plain truth, the straight testimony? What was it? And it says, shockingly, for believing that Jesus is the Son of God. <gasps> what? How can that be? I was stunned. How can you throw I mean, that's an Adventist doctrine. It's, it's biblical. Jesus is the Son of God. But as I watch, I, I, I realize very soon what it was. Because they believe that Jesus is literally the Son of God. That he somehow came out from the Father. Somewhere in the ages of eternity. One moment there was no Jesus. The next there was. He's literally his son. That is not biblical. They were not disfellowshipped for believing that Jesus is the Son of God. They were disfellowshipped for insisting and spreading confusion about what that means and denying the eternal nature of Christ. But you see people's willingness to distort and disregard the will of God? That's not okay. It's not okay. It's okay to disagree. Let's study it out. But it's not okay to lie. Let's move on. Speaking of the de deity of Christ, or, or the, the, the Godhead, there's a growing belief that not only is they're just the Father, and then the Son came after. That the Holy Spirit isn't even a person. That he's some energetic force. The presence of God, his influence, his power, but he's not a person. In fact, they will tell you that the Holy Spirit is the Father. Or the Son. Or the Father and the Son. It's very confusing. But look at what Jesus said. John chapter 14, verse 26. John chapter 14, verse 26. And I recognize that what we're discussing, big topic. There's a lot to it. But we're talking about the simplicity that is in Christ. I'm just raising concern, pointing it out. 1426, Jesus said, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom, whom, that's a person. The Father will send in my name. He, that's a person, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So one, Holy Spirit is a whom and a he, a person. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father. He said the Father would send him. You do not send yourself. That is logically inconsistent. And the Father said, Jesus said in Isaiah, let us reason together. But what about Jesus? Look at chapter 15, verse 26 also. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Third person, first person. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus, yet is still a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is distinct from the Father and the Son. I'm going to read to you from Desire of Ages. Because there's a lot of wrangling of things that Ellen White has said. A manuscript here, a letter there. Do you know Ellen White said, if you want to know what she really believes, quote from her published works, the ones that she really puts out there. I would say Desire of Ages qualifies. 
Is the Godhead a one, a two, or a three? Let's look. Desire of Ages, page 671, second paragraph. In describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided for his church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent. And without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be, re listen, sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. Third person. Desire of Ages, page 671, paragraph 2. In other places, he, she says that the Holy Spirit is as much a person as God is. The third person. I've been in conversations where they, it is twisted so much that third doesn't mean third. Three is not three. Distortion and disregard. I like this one to really clinch it. This really clinched it for me. The arguments about was Ellen White a Trinitarian or not? She said in a sermon in, on, in 1885, speaking of when people would come to you to talk trash about somebody else, another believer, you know, gossip. You find this in the second volume of Sermon and Talks, Sermons and Talks, page 22, paragraph 5. In this sermon, she counsels what to do when you're approached by your friendly neighborhood local church gossip. If you cannot stop that voice in any other way, Lift your voice and sing the doxology. Vain talkers and mischief makers are Satan's agents in doing his work. How were we to combat gossip? How are we to combat Satan's agents in doing his work? Singing praises to the Trinity. That's the doxology. The doxology. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. An anti-Trinitarian would not, would not recommend that believers sing the Trinitarian doxology to combat Satan. There is a simplicity in Christ. But deception complicates the truth. Next. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 29. This one's really popular. This is a popular deception. It comes to us courtesy of our dispensationalist friends who want to relegate the Old Testament to the literal descendants of Israel and keep it out of the church. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. I'm sorry, I didn't give you time to find it. Jeremiah 29, 11.
For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And we are told now, repeatedly, there are t-shirts, there are mugs, there are memes, there are sermons, that we can't quote this anymore. Because this verse is talking to the Jews that were living in Babylon or, or, or in Jerusalem, surrounded by Nebuchadnezzar's armies. And they were going to fight. And God was saying, you need to surrender. Go. In fact, go with them. Live there. Plant your gardens. Raise your families. Pray for the, for the uh, success of, of the Babylonian nation because you'll benefit too while you're there. And in 70 years, I'll send your people home, back to Jerusalem. And, he sa- you know, and so he says, I know the thoughts that I thank towards you. Go. I'm hiding good things for you. It's okay. Just go. Accept your licks. You earned this. Now take it. Go. Right? So that was a specific context. And the, and the, and the we, I mean, we're mocked for saying, oh, see, that isn't you. You're not about to be taken a prisoner to the city of Babylon. This isn't about you. Stop quoting it. It's not about you. You're quoting it out of context. He's not talking about God's plans for you in your life. So you need to stop. That's a lie. And I'll tell you why. Look in Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 27. Jeremiah 44, verse 27. Forty-four twenty-seven. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. He's also talking to Jews. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. Now he says, I'm looking at you for evil, not good. What's the deal? Well, when you prayerfully look at God's word, you understand what's going on. One group, he's saying, the nation of Israel, Judah, is being judged. You know why. Submit. Go to Babylon. Go in peace, and I'll bring you back. I have plans for you that are good, not evil. Go. There were there was a small group of Jews that were left. They wanted to go to Egypt. This is after the bulk of, of the Jewish nation was taken off in captivity. They wanted to go to Egypt. And so they went to Jeremiah and said, what does God say? And Jeremiah says, okay. And he came back to them and he said, no, you go to, you go to Egypt and you're going to get wiped out. In fact, God is saying, I'm not looking at good for you evil. Don't do this. And here's why. They had settled in their heart that no matter what Jeremiah told them God said, they were going to Egypt no matter what. They didn't really care what God's will was. It was a formality. In fact, they made excuses. They said, you know, everything was fine until we stopped worshiping idols. We should just go and go back into idolatry. What is the lesson here? The lesson is, is when you are in submission to God, whether it's off to captivity in Babylon because it's a judgment for your own choices, or anything else that is the will of God, when you submit, God's plans for you are good. But when you are so set on doing what you want, no matter what God says, you have nothing but evil coming your way. That's the lesson of Jeremiah 29. And this is why, while it may not be about you, it is for you. Never, never let the devil take away from you one jot or tittle of his word. Never. It is for you. 
Because here's what I always find puzzling. The same people who say we can't quote Jeremiah 29, 11, will then turn around and quote verse 13. Look at Jeremiah 29, 13. It's the, it's the craziest thing. Jeremiah 20, 30, 29, 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. He's talking to the same people in verse 11. Distort and disregard. Every word, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Jesus said, is the bread of life. Next. Here's where you think you know where I'm going with this and you'd be wrong. Here's where I really don't want to preach this one. God help me. Let's look at 1 Timothy 3 2. First Timothy 3 2. My King James calls, uses the word bishop. He's talking about elders. A bishop or elder, pastor, then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Now this is one of those texts that is at the heart of the debate within all of Christianity, but in recent years, especially within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What's interesting is most denominations have had this battle. Some have won and some have lost. A lot of them have lost. We're still fighting it. And it's the question of ordination, women's ordination in particular. And this is one of the central key texts where it says that, you know, it says right here, an elder then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Interestingly, Paul literally says, a one-woman man, male, right? And we're arguing about that. I'm not here to talk about women's ordination. In fact, I'm perfectly fine to disagree with anybody about it. It's fine. I'm not going to divide a church over it. I'm really not. I have no interest. In fact, I think that's what the devil would want. Here's where I am willing to divide. This is what people are saying, and I'll be blunt. This is coming from the pro-women's ordination side. It's in verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Ralph, what are you talking about? How is that so dangerous? Notice what it says. If a man desire the office of a bishop or elder, he desireth a good work. And this is the response. You can't use 1 Timothy chapter 3 when we're talking about male or versus female ordination. You can't talk about that because it's not talking about that. It's only applicable when a man wants to be ordained. So if the man wants to be ordained, then it kicks in. We're talking about women's ordination. Therefore, 1 Timothy chapter 3 doesn't apply. That's really cute. And for a while, I, even, I was like, ooh, 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 good one. Okay, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with women's ordination. I don't. But I'm not willing to divide over it. 
I'm not. But I looked at that other, ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. So I looked at it. And here's something interesting. Paul does not say if a man desires the office of elder, he desires a good work. He says if anyone desires to be an elder, anyone, the word he uses is tis, a person, anybody, could be anybody. That person desires a good work. It's a good thing to desire to be an elder. Here are the qualifications. Blameless. One woman man. And then he goes on. Being male is a qualification, as I read it. Faithful Christians read that and disagree. I'm okay with that. What I'm not okay with is distorting what verse 1 says and using that to disregard the rest. That's not what it says. It says if anyone... Why am I bringing this up? Because I'm finding it all too common for people to to raise a narrative, to play fast and loose with what is true, with context, with the whole story, to push a narrative in the church and are splitting the church. It's awful. I will use an example. Recently, the New Jersey conference announced plans to host a woman's retreat or conference and got a tidal wave of of pushback. Here's why. All of the speakers in this women's retreat, this conference, all of the speakers, Every single one was a man. Now, you can understand why that would concern some people. What do you, only men can talk to women? Are there no women that, that have something to say? This is horrible. How could you? Oppression. Sexism. The conference leadership beat a rapid retreat. They apologized. And you know what's interesting? Their apology, the responses were online, their apology is just as sweet as, what, as the error that they did. They loved it. It was not good enough. They were oppressors. Here's something even more interesting. One woman who was familiar with the situation said, actually, I'm okay with it. I think that what they were doing was really good, and, and, and they, were, they, were, they had very good intentions, and I'm okay with it. And a man, a man decided that it was okay in this context to mansplain her and let her know that, oh, no, 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 you're a victim. Literally said that. You're a victim. See? They're gaslighting you. You just don't know it. So I, Mr. White Knight, shall help you so that you know you're a victim. They have victimized you. They have gaslit you. Gaslit, gaslighted. That looks really, really bad. So the New Jersey Conference apologized and canceled the retreat. Why do I bring this up? It came up here, that little bit of news. In fact, when it came up here, I knew that there was a report on it somewhere that I had saved to read later. And I hadn't gotten to it yet. So when it came up, I thought, okay, something's not right. So I left here. I went into my car. And before I went and did anything, I pulled out that article and I read it. Here's the full story. There was going to be a woman's retreat in the New Jersey conference. Yes, all the speakers, every single one was a man. Every single one. And they were going to talk to women about what they believe is a value of woman in God's work and in God's church as women. Oh, and the responses were, "Uh, I don't need a man to tell me what I'm worth. Uh, No, thank you. These were the responses. Okay? It is true. 
What has been consistently left out is this. In August, there was a men's retreat planned by the New Jersey Conference. Who do you think all the speakers were going to be there? All women. You see, the leadership of the New Jersey Conference, and I don't know these people, never been there, they could be dirty dogs. I wouldn't know. But they had in mind that wouldn't it be wonderful to hear from each other. At the women's retreat, they could hear from the men, hear, hear how much we value them and also what we need from them. And at the men's retreat, we will sit under the instruction of women so that they could tell us what we mean to them and what they need from us. So we could learn from each other and go together united in the cause of Christ. Wouldn't that be wonderful? No. No, absolutely not. We can't do that. But do you see how that changes the picture? This wasn't oppression. It wasn't misogyny. It wasn't sexism. But it was used as a wedge to push a narrative to divide the church. Why? Let me read something to you. This one is a compilation that I have. This is from, um, well, Ellen White was at a meeting, a, a camp meeting in Australia that uh, it was Armadale, the Armadale Conference. And if anyone has studied what the Armadale Conference was, the major speaker was W.W. W. Prescott, and she raved about his sermons there. It was like 1888 Part 2. It was amazing. Power powered by the Holy Spirit. She insisted that those sermons needed to be printed and distributed. There was prejudice, deep prejudice in Australia against the Adventist church. But because of those meetings, the prejudice was taken down because they heard Christ in all the doctrines. Powerful. Well, there was a, a, a break, a period there, where in this, uh, this series of meetings, leaders, including Ellen White, were meeting, and they were talking about and of all things, the work for the, uh, uh, the southern region of the United States. Now, back then, they referred to black people as coloreds. It was, you know, the 1800s. But notice what she said. There was an issue because there were some Sabbath versus Sunday issues not working on the Sunday and that type of thing in the south that, that people were dealing with. And it was particularly troubling for uh, the black people that were living there. But notice what she said. This is interesting. When the white people try to educate the colored people in the truth, notice, white people try to educate the colored people in the truth. These are missionaries, pastors, evangelists, Bible workers. Jealousy is aroused and ministers, both colored and white, will bitterly oppose the truth. The colored ministers think that they know how to preach to their own race better than the white ministers can, and they feel that the whites are taking the work out of their hands. By falsehood, they will create the most decided opposition, and those among the white people who are opposed to the truth will help them and will make it exceedingly hard for the work of the message to advance. Note that. They turned it into, it's about who's giving the message and not the message, right? Oh, but here it was, only black people can talk to black people. White people are coming in to take over. And so they fought the message out of jealousy. They opposed the truth by falsehood, she said. Why? To make it exceedingly hard for the work of the message to advance. I personally experienced this when we were dealing with hearing versus deaf ministry. I was not deaf. Only deaf people can talk to deaf people. And a ministry, a national ministry, was almost destroyed because of that division. Only women can talk to women. Only men can talk to men. Deception. All intending to destroy the work of God. It is a distraction. It is intended to do nothing more than to divide. But here's what's so interesting. 
and sad and frightening. This is really why I'm talking about it. There has been an evolution or a devolution in this whole argument, in this discussion. Because there's been disagreement over what a verse means. Now it's a discussion as to whether it even matters what the verse means or says. You see, the General Conference had a theology of ordination study committee, TOSC. They couldn't make up their minds, so they came up with three positions. One against, one for, and one that said, eh, mostly against, but sometimes it's okay. Two-thirds, though, two of those three reports basically says, yes, ordination is, is designed to be granted to men. That is the general conference report. The NAD, the North American Division, came up with their own committee, also leading up to the 2015 general conference session. The North American Division had a task committee, 15 members, I believe. The overwhelming majority of the members of that committee came up with, nope, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay, to or women's ordination is biblical, and that's fine. But here's what was interesting and concerning, and to some very alarming. They said, it all depends on the rules that you follow to interpret the Bible. And what was proposed was a new system of interpreting the Bible. They called it the principles-based hermeneutic. It's actually a longer name, but that's how, what they use, it for, use for short. Principles-based hermeneutic. They came up with a new set of rules to make it okay. And said, it is okay if you change the rules. Have you ever played with somebody who's losing? And then in the middle of the game, they switched the rules because they were losing so they could start winning? Anybody like that? I don't. It's dishonest. But that is what has done, been done. I looked it up last night. It's still there. It's not a thing that anyone's trying to cover up. They changed the rules. Why is that a problem? Because it's now a principle-based approach. You decide the principle and decide what the Bible means based on the principle. In this case, equality. Or in this case, love. And you can say, well, the Bible may say this, but I know based on the principle of love and equality that God would be okay with it. So I'm going to interpret the scripture that way. And thus violate the scripture principle that says no scripture is of private interpretation. You don't get to decide what God's word says on your own. You don't get to make it up. It is our responsibility to find out what God's word says and submit. This is how bad it has gotten. That door is now open. This is how bad it has gotten within the Adventist church. There are leaders who literally have said, Scripture is not truth. Jesus is truth. They have torn Jesus and the Bible apart. There are people now who say, well, yes, the Bible may say this, but we worship Jesus, not the Bible. Therefore, it's okay. In fact, anyone who disagrees is called an idolater of the Bible. How dare you put the Bible above Jesus? They have separated God's word from the word, the Son of God. Why? To push a narrative. To push a narrative. To create God in their image. And I don't think it's intentionally, or, or, or people are thinking, yes, <laughs> I shall create God in my image. I shall disregard God's word. No, they really believe it's, it's the right thing to do in the name of love and equality. But that is a deception. That's not what God's word says. Look at what Jesus did. If what they say is absolutely true, what we read in Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus contends with the devil and his, and his temptations, Jesus would say, Go away from me. How dare you approach me? Because he is the truth. He is the word. But he didn't. He said, it is written. 
and quotes from, of all people, Moses. Three times he quotes from Deuteronomy. He quotes from the law, the covenant. So says it is written. He didn't use his own authority. He used the authority of scripture when he contended with the devil. Jesus, when he prayed for his disciples, told us how we should think about the word. John chapter 17, verse 17. Jesus prayed to the Father. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This was our defense. This, not attitudes. Submission to the authority of God's word was, is our only safeguard. But there are people now in shockingly high positions in our church who are saying the very opposite. It's the trajectory, the, di the direction that we see in the Bible that matters. And they follow that trajectory right off the page of the Bible. Every single argument that I've seen made using this argument has being made now in favor of homosexual marriage and homosexual, active homosexual individuals being ordained as ministers. This exact same arguments. It's here. Because the devil has continued to apply his trade of deception, distort and disregard. Literally people telling you it doesn't matter if the word says this. I know that God actually means that we should love people, so therefore we could do it anyway. That is a hermeneutic from hell. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. So what do we do? What do we do? First, I want to give you some resources. And if you're interested, I'll leave this card up here. If anyone wants to copy them, go for it. Take a picture of it. Website, Godhead, godheadtruth.org. It's a young man in Australia, Joel Ridgway. He used to be part of the uh, growing movement, the anti-Trinitarian movement in the Adventist church. God broke through to him. It's near impossible. But God broke through to him. He's done amazing things to show what the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy truly say. That there are three persons comprising the Godhead. Not one, not two. Beltoftruthministries.org Led by a man, Scott Ritzema. R-I-T-S-E-M-A, Scott Ritzema profound ministry specializing in the influence that the world has on our mind how to fortify the mind beltoftruthministries.org in fact he has a wonderful set of, of lectures on media on the, on the brain the influences of media and also a greater lust it's a series that he has, a six-part series on the damage that pornography cause, causes in the mind and how to overcome it. In fact, he had made an offer, sent them out to anybody who wanted them for free. Six-volume DVD set. I grabbed six of them, gave Josh three of them. Anybody who wants to look at it, help people that you know are struggling with it, hit him up. He's got three sets. Young people, actually anybody, but especially young people, college students, check out Little Light Studios if you haven't yet. Little Light Studios. Their YouTube channel, phenomenal. 
check out two guys by the name of Eric. No relation. One, Dr. Eric Walsh. Anything that man has to say. Now again, I'm not endorsing everything. So please understand the spirit in which I give this. Test everything by the word of God, including me. But Dr. Eric Walsh, look him up, YouTube. Another Eric, Eric Wilson, best known for a series he gave called The Dragon Revealed. He's got like black belt after black belt after black belt in martial arts and got out of it because he was finally led to understand what it was really all about. He's a profound student of scripture and the spirit of prophecy. Eric Wilson. Dwayne Lemon. Dwayne Lemon. Okay, I'll be honest. I haven't heard everything the man has said. I've heard a lot of what he said. I have yet to hear something that is, is just off. <laughs> Dwayne Lemon. What he has to say about social justice will blow your mind. It will blow your mind. Check out his sermon on YouTube called I Can't Breathe. Referring to George Floyd, check out his sermon, I Can't Breathe. It's a longer title. It comes, it's followed by a series of numbers. Check it out. You will weep. You will be led to repent. If you haven't discovered these, what are you doing? Audioverse.org. Inverity.org. Rightlytrained.org. And then look up American Christian Ministries. Some of us old timers remember them as American Cassette Ministries. They used to have albums of cassette recordings of various presentations by pastors and speakers. It's now online. All of these websites, thousands and thousands of hours of biblical teaching from a variety of speakers. Learn. Immerse yourselves in the teaching of God's word. Not everyone is right on every point, but learn. What else are you going to be doing? resources. I want to leave you with one final thing. And you've been very kind. You've been very patient. Second Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 8. Second Timothy 4, 1 through 8. Paul is basically saying goodbye to his protege. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come and it's here now. When they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to unto all them also that love is appearing. God help us to be, among, to be among those people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words. 
Thank you for your graciousness, for suffering long with us. Forgive us for our confusion. Forgive us for when we have erred. Lord God, give us your Holy Spirit. Now more than ever, we need clarity, we need truth, we need the mind of Christ. Bless us with this, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.